Now, this um, next phase is uh, a new game, and I had a bunch of games ready to show you, but I left them on my flash drive, which I guess I left at home. I hope I, hopefully I didn't lose it. Uh, but I wanted to show you these examples of the next game that we're going to do, and I, and I don't have any of them actually then to show you because I didn't bring my flash drive. But the idea, try to visualize it this way, the idea will be that there is a, um, it's a point and click style game where you, it'll be like a first person point of view and you see a scene and there's various parts like let's say the, the demo that I'm going to walk us through is going to be a haunted house. My character is going to go through a haunted house. So there's going to be different hallways, different rooms and things. So at the very beginning, you know, there's you walk up to the haunted house, there's a gate. Well, you need to first click on the the the, the lock of the gate to open it. So then it'll it'll open. Then we'll walk into the main house. We got to get in the house. So we will try the window. We'll try the door. We're going to be clicking on things to try to interact. We're going to be able to pick up things and maybe pick up this key to put it into this door to then walk in. So it's going to be that kind of game. It's not going to be fast paced. It's going to be, you know, point and click game, dragging things. Um, there will be the uh, ability to have like also uh, decisions in terms of if uh, if you try to open this door before pulling this lever, spikes get you. So it's going to be one of these games that like everything kills you. Um, and then you have to navigate through it the right way. And it can have branching paths. What if I go through the left hallway? What, what, what 20 rooms are over there? What if I go through the center place? So again, I would love to show you this. I left my flash drive somewhere. I hope I didn't lose it. But I'll show you them next time. But we'll start to set ourselves up for that. So it'll be a point and click adventure style game. And again, you're going to need to make your own graphics and choose your own sounds. And the code. Um, it, it's going to be again more coding, uh, but let me just get a quick show of hands here if, if you want to answer honestly. Now that we've been doing the coding aspect of things, how many of you kind of like it, the code? Okay, good. Now, how many of you kind of hate it? That's a perfectly good answer. Okay, tricked. Okay, let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Anyway, so um, if you really liked it, that's um, the next level of any of this interactive stuff. It's the coding aspect. Things don't happen unless you code it, because I might be a great artist, but then I want my project to be interactive. That's when coding comes in. Code hints are very helpful, but a lot of time you have to write your own custom code, as we were doing. So same thing here. And even though I want to pretend that I have it all memorized, I do have notes. I am looking at my notes right here to, to redo the code. And in this one, it's going to be about 400 lines of code. So that's not even a big program, actually. 400 lines of code is not that much. There are other programs that are millions of lines of code. So a 400 lines of code for our project is not a lot. But what we'll be able to do in this project is navigate to different rooms, interact with the um, different environments, pick things up, um, and um, it'll be a kind of a fun thing. And again, next time I'll show you examples from previous classes. I just, I don't know what happened to my flash drive. So what you want to do is, in Adobe Animate, we're, we're going to create another Air project. This is going to be a brand new file, just like before. And um, even if you're not uh, fully done with the previous project, there'll be a, bit, a little bit of lab time next time. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, after the lecture. So um, I would not be working on your other project. I would be working on this one that we're about to talk about. So here, I'm going to select uh, File, New, Menu. And on the left side, we'll select Android or Air for Android. 
Um, this says 480 by 800. This is another one where I want to set it as a landscape project. So we want to flip those over. We want to go 800. Let me zoom in here. We want to go 800 by 480. So just flip those two values over. It would be nice if they had like a button to click to just flip them over. But I need that. Do you need a tablet? All right, so I'm going to flip these over to 800 by 480, leave it as 24 frames, and I'll click OK. I'm going to save this, file save as, into my flash drive. I'll put this into a brand new folder called Topic 4. With today's date, 2019-07-22, just uh, the thing is you, you have to create a folder and make sure that this project is in the folder. That seems to be a weird little bug that you have to make sure that this file is saved in the folder. And just to test this out, I'm just going to draw a quick happy face so that I can deploy it to my uh, tablet. So this is um, this is basic. We've done this before. We create a new file, and uh, then we're going to um, dip, uh, publish it to our tablet. So I just want to uh, create something here so I can see it when I actually publish it. So we go to File, Android Settings. File, Android Settings. I'll switch over to Language, set your language. Permissions, I'll activate internet. General, we want that as landscape. So even though I, I moved my dimensions to be landscape, I have to remember that under my general tab, I also have to set it to landscape. And then deployment. You can use the same certificate that you created for your previous project. That might actually be a little faster. Because if you, if you don't... Um, use that previous certificate, you, you have to go through a little process here of creating it again. So you might as well just browse and select your previous certificate. And as usual, select it to be deployed and installed to the device.
So here I'm just trying to do the very basic um, create a file and then deploy it to my tablet just to confirm that I can do that very, very basic thing. If I see my happy face appear, I'm good. If I don't, I want to get that working, of course, before I go too much further and do the complex stuff. So either reuse your existing certificate or create a new one and then deploy it to your device. So eventually when you see your device will, when we see it on your device will go on. Anyone having a little trouble?
All right, so let's set ourselves up here. Um, this was basic, we've done this before, and uh, what we're gonna set ourselves up with is uh, we're gonna set up the various screens first and then go in and uh, add the coding. Now, this is not the time for me to design my project perfectly. That'll be what the lab time is for. So we're going to just set up our, our basic aspects of this project. First of all, our scenes. Um, so one trick that we might want to do here actually is I know that I want to do various scenes. But the problem when you run your project, it'll zoom through all your scenes unless you put a stop command, right? So if we set up this first scene with our actions layer and with a stop command, why don't we just then duplicate that scene over and over? It'll automatically have the actions um, layer plus the stop command instead of manually having to create a new actions layer on each of the five scenes we'll create and so forth. So here, let's uh, change our layer one to be called actions, capital A. And then I'll open the actions and add a stop command. So this is all happening on the current. Um, this is all happening on the current scene one that we just created, and I mean that we get by default automatically. So actions layer stop command that's all we need we don't want it to automatically play over and over now I'll open up window scenes and I've got a scene one let's see we're gonna need a a uh, home scene, kind of like our welcome scene. I guess we can call it the same thing, a welcome scene, a help scene. We're going to have various rooms in this haunted house. Now, I'm going to be designing for a demo a haunted house. But your particular game doesn't have to be a haunted house. They can be exploring, you know, a zombie-filled uh, city or a forest or... Um, you know, various rooms in your house and it's not scary and whatever. So your game could be exploring anything. It's just that they have to explore a few various places. My idea is I'm going to be at the front gate of the house, then the front door, then a couple of hallways, and then a good ending and a bad ending. Now we're mostly going to see the bad ending a lot because this house is very deadly. So there's going to be six scenes at least. You can make more if you want more rooms to explore and such, more scenes to explore. So here under scene one, we've got a little duplicate button. So I'm going to duplicate it. And I said, uh, how many do I need? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, nine in total. So just duplicate that until you have nine in total. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, so they're obviously all going to have the same name. But the important thing is that now all of these scenes have at least my actions layer. And it has a stop so that I don't have to go to each one and waste my time to add it individually. If I add it to my first scene and then just duplicate, it saves me some time. So then I'm going to call these scenes anything we want. But we will start this as SC Welcome. Just like before, this is a scene, and it has a name, welcome, the welcome screen. You know, our intro screen that has our the title of our game, and then there we're going to have the two buttons, play and help. So we'll have another scene of scene help. Then I'm going to have a couple of different rooms to go through. So scene gate. So the idea is my character has wandered to this, you know, scary haunted house, this mansion. They're right at the at the uh, at the curb. So before I can even get into the house, there's a gate, and 
there's going to be, it's a little bit of a puzzle sort of game. Do I click on this? Do I pull this? Do I pick this up and put it here? We can get pretty fancy in that I pick up something from one room and take it to another, of course. But depending on our time, let's see how far we go. But at the very least, the, the gate is going to be one of the easiest ones. I, I click the gate to open it. Not a big deal. The next scene is going to be scene door. You know, the front door. This one's, the first puzzle is going to happen here. We're going to have a few different ways to possibly get in. Through the front door, through one of the windows, you know, through a broken um, piece of wood, or perhaps picking up something to interact with something else. So this scene will have a few different ways, not just a very linear way, like the gate. I'm going to have then scene hall the first hall, the first room that I enter. Again, these can be called anything you want. Let's say I'm in the forest. So I'm going through the forest and I have, you know, uh, I've seen lake where I'm standing by the lake and I do something at the lake. And then I take another route and I'm at, you know, seen jungle trees where I've got all of these certain kinds of trees and so forth. So these things could be called anything you want. They don't Technically, when you do your version, if you just leave them as is, you won't get graded badly. If you do make like a, you're navigating a space station. Uh, I don't have a gate in a space station. Well, that's fine. You can leave the names of the scenes if you want. If your code works, that's great. If your graphics and sound are there, that's great. I'm not going to stress or worry about the like little things like that. So in this hallway, again, we're going to have different things we can do. What about if I try to pick up that painting? What about if I move this pot? What if I go to the left? hallway or the right hallway. So in just in this demo sort of thing, just to get us started, I'm going to have scene hall left and scene hall right. This is a perfect example where if I have first perhaps planned a little bit in terms of on a piece of paper or whatever, if I had something like this, I have I start at the, the gate. And then that takes me to the front door. So there's a front door. And then that takes me over here, and it takes me over here, and it takes me over here and here. So if you have something planned out on paper, first, it'll also make sense for this. I already have a general plan. But when you want to make your own version of it, your own vision, <coughs> just doing a simple drawing like that can help. Because we have a left hallway and a right hallway. And we have scene and bad and scene and good. That's gonna be a it's gonna start we're gonna start off together in a very small amount of um, possibilities. And, and I hope that as you get your code working and get more ideas, you go left hallway, then basement, then you know, attic, and then like zombie room one and all of that, whatever. Whatever you want to figure out to do in your particular project. So I have these particular scenes, rooms, and concepts. Back to the welcome scene. And here, just a simple title screen, screen like the house. Just some quick title screen with two super simple buttons to play or get help. So again, if you're doing some sort of different um, concept, you can fill in the concept during lab times. Don't get too worked up about doing a lot of great design just yet. 
for my first scene, scene welcome. There's my intro title screen. I'll go to the help screen, similar to eventually on the help, I'll maybe tell a little story or tell people, um, you know, click, click the environment to interact, try picking things up, you know, some sort of message, some sort of help. So I'll go over to scene help. Click to interact. Try to drag and drop. And then a back button. Just some quick message on, on help. The idea is on this help screen. Remember when you did the, pod, uh, the episode about the podcast and one of the uh, 10 things that every game needs is rules. Well, this is your screen where you talk about the rules a little bit, such as um, you're clicking on things, maybe you're dragging things. Um, I'm just doing something super quick. I might want to get a little bit more detailed later and um, I can lay out some things about um, try picking something up, you know, giving some rules. In theory, we could set up a timer. We're not going to have a timer on this. It'll be totally self-guided. The person can go through the various rooms on their own, but we could set a timer. Not that when the time runs out, you're dead, but you could set a timer like, you know, like a lot of video games, what they do is if you get to the end of the game within 10 minutes, it's a certain ending. If you do it in 15 minutes, it's another ending. If it's in 20 minutes, it's another ending. So we can combine what we did with timers from the previous game with this one here. Uh, we're not going to quite get to that, so it'll be self-paced. Gate, in the gate scene. So some sort of super simple screen to get the user or the player acclimated to your environment that it is simply click here to start to go in again my idea is I'm visiting a haunted house there's a big scary gate in front of the haunted house and I want to click the gate to open it to go into the later parts of the of the game so again I'll draw this really nice later but for the moment I'm gonna draw some sort of gate And, you know, we may have the idea to get really fancy and all of that, but I'll get fancy and I'll design it really well later. So the idea in this particular room, in this particular scene, is simply the person on their tablet will just click, tap on the gate, and it'll open up. Nothing too special. I can make it really fancier later that I, I need to do other things in the environment. But for the first scene, it's just click on the gate to move forward. Now, for myself, when I do this, I kind of like to zoom out a lot. And if I go past the edges of the canvas, that's fine. Because uh, you might have seen that when you were testing it on the various tablets, um, sometimes there's stuff that you drew to the very edge of your canvas, but then the tablet might show a little bit past it. So think in terms about that. If I draw a little bit beyond my canvas, that should be fine, because some tablets might show a little bit more and some a little less. So if I, if I drew something like that, and if it doesn't show what's at the edge, I'm fine. It wasn't important. But if there's a tablet that shows a little bit more, and then suddenly my drawing ends before it gets to the final 10 pixels, it'll look weird and amateur. 
So I go past a little bit on my edges usually. Next scene, oh, actually before that, I started to draw this gate on the actions layer. Whoops, I want that on its own layer, so no problem. I can select all of that that I drew, I can cut it, make a new layer called gate, and paste in place. Forgot about that. So actions layer for actions, and then your assets on their own layer. Depending how we're interacting, we probably want to separate things. So this is supposed to be like the street sign Maybe if I wanted to do it that I can actually flip this over, I might put that on its own layer. You know, uh, house sign on its own layer. Uh, I'll just cut this and put it all into a brand new layer called Git. So I'm going to select everything I drew there. Control X, cut. And then right click, paste in place. I, I almost forgot, forgot about that, so be careful there. Actions layer only has your actions. Stop. And gate layer has the drawing of the gate. And I did a cut and paste to transfer it. On the door layer, I'm going to lock action so that I don't accidentally draw there and make a new layer. This is going to be the front door. But also, this one will be a little bit different in that I've got two windows. The idea with this one is that instead of like the very first scene of the gate where you simply click the gate and you walk in, this one is going to be that actually you have to break in through the window. So um, we'll figure out why our character has to break in through the window later. Right now we'll just say that they're breaking and entering, but we'll figure out why a little later. So instead of going in straight through the door, um, they need to, they're going to need to break a window. So that might be necessary then that there is a tree branch on the floor. I want to pick up that tree branch and use it to break the window, or a baseball bat, or a rock. Actually, let me draw a rock instead. Here's a rock. Or a 2 by 4 or whatever. So this one's going to be different in terms of the person is going to play your game and get to the gate and simply tap and it opens. Most likely, when a person gets to this scene, what do they think? What do you think they're going to click on first? The door. Well, we're going to do it eventually. That you click on the door and it just rattles. Nothing happens. It doesn't actually open. It just rattles. And usually, when I teach this, we have it rattle, and also it, you hear a little growl sound. So they think the first thing. Let's open the door. Whoops! It's locked. Then they look around in the environment and oh, there's a rock or a pipe or whatever. What about if I pick up the rock? and put it or throw it to the window, that's the way that's going to let us go past this scene into the main hallway. We're going to break in by uh, putting or throwing one object into another. This will be hit detection. One object is going to interact with another object. So maybe also there's a little path over here, whatever. Again, I'll figure out all the details later. Maybe a cool little thing to ring the doorbell. I'll figure it out later. So this is the door. I'll pick up the rock, throw it at the window. We go into the hallway. In the hallway, we're going to have a little bit of perspective here in terms of the... Um, they walk into, into the front, they break in through the door, through the glass, but you're in the first room. And then you can take a right path or a left path. In front of you is just a wall, and there's a painting. And for something fun, we will be able to also do these, these like dead ends of things in terms of, 
maybe a person sees the painting and they're like, let me touch the painting. Um, and what we're going to make it do is if the person taps the painting one time, you know, it'll wiggle. And if they do it again, then it'll fall down and break. So the painting will fall on the floor and, you know, the environment will be affected. So I'm going to put it that it's stuck on, I mean, that it's um, you know, nailed to you know, one of these paintings where it's like nailed to a little thing. But the string was really thin. So they're going to tap it once it wiggles. They tap it again. Oh, that was fun. Let me tap it again. They tap it again, but this time it breaks. And it has a sound effect, breaking glass, and it animates and it falls down. Again, all of this is going to happen through action script and not a very complex action script. It's going to be a lot about code, about um, event listeners listening for a tap or a double tap or an event listener to um, keep track of. They tapped it once, they tapped it twice, taps equals greater than two, falls down. Taps less than two, stays in place. And then put sound and so forth. So, um, let's see, there's also just like a carpet there. Now, on any of these games, we're going to create like a minimum baseline of things, but then you can go beyond it. Like, what about if I pull the carpet over? Is there something below it? Based on the code that we talk about, you will be able to then go one step outside the box, because when we learn tapping on something to make it do something, which we've done before, but we'll do it again, what if I tap on that carpet and below it is a secret key? Because what if later on I've got a door that is locked, but I pick up a key over here? Okay, um, so we've got the left hallway. Let's go to the left hallway, and then once again, whoops, I drew everything on the wrong layer, so let me cut that and put it onto its own layer. Um, this is just hallway. See, that's very easy to forget. Um, it'll be okay, but it's better to have things separated, which I forgot to do. So let me fix that before I go to the hallway, uh, to the left hall. I'm going to move the hallway to its own layer. Or I'm going to draw it on its own layer. So now I'll go to the left hallway, I'll make a new layer. Left hallway, new layer. Left hallway. Okay, on this one, we're gonna see at the end of the hallway, door and we're all the way you know we just walked into this hallway so at the end of the hallway there's a door over there um, there could be also a another door in that hallway, so now we got these possibilities of going straight ahead or going to this door to the right. And then also there is up here, up on the roof, there is a, what is this, um, like a uh, pole string for an attic, yeah. So. Um, Again, I'm just drawing it a little fast. I can draw it a little better a little later. But here I've got three possible paths that people can take here. What if I just go straight ahead? What if I go to the right? What if I go up? 
if I have it all mapped up, uh, mapped out on a paper, you know, I could go forever. I could make lots and lots of rooms. How many of you have ever played any sort of these adventure click and uh, tap and click games? So a lot of people. So think about what you've seen before and think about making your own version focused on your character. I won't. It won't be bad if you take your character. Um, you know, let's say my mine's like a superhero that I did for projects one, two, and three. It won't be it won't be bad, you won't be deducted points or whatever if you have your superhero going through a haunted house. It's fine. I would love it if instead it's your idea of what they're actually doing. They're going through a space station, they're going through the forest, whatever. But you know, I am gonna be looking for the requirements as I'll lay them out a little later, about you need to be able to go to one, two, three rooms or whatever, you need to have sound, you need to have your code working, and I'll lay out those requirements soon enough. So here we've got the left hallway. Okay, let's do the right hallway. It's going to be kind of the opposite angle. So the end of the hallway is over here. The perspective goes this way. There's a door at the end. This time, instead of there being um, a door, there's also a painting. So there's a door, but then also close to where you're standing, there's a painting. So that's another thing to interact with. This one doesn't have any sort of like roof path. And in this one, perhaps the person can go straight ahead, they can go left. What about if I try that painting? On the previous room, uh, there was a painting and I interacted and something happened. Well, on this one, I'm gonna try again. I tap it once and it kind of wiggles. I tap it again and this time it opens up and there's a demon inside, game over. So there's a lot of things that we can do and uh, mostly, probably, we will be putting a lot of ways to not win the game, and then like one way to win the game. do bad ending and good ending. Again, there's still a lot that I can do, and I can do as much as I want, if I have the time to program it. And if we look at the calendar, you know, we don't have a huge amount of time. The last day of class is the 7th. So we're going to be able to make these various rooms work and do various things. If you want to add beyond it, you can. Remember our time. So when we get to... Um, we do a little bit of more coding. I'll give you the final lab time for the previous game. The next time we do some lab time, uh, some lecture time for the for this game again, and then some lab time, and then a little lecture, a little lab, and then probably probably the fifth is going to be complete lab day, because then it's due on the seventh, and you know we'll have time. This on this game we have a little bit more time than the tap frenzy one because it's a little more complex. Okay, bad ending. So whatever sort of ending again, like uh, some sort of message that that uh, you lost, and um, uh, a way to replay or to quit. It's supposed to be a skull, but it looks more like a squid. Okay, we'll say a dead squid. Yes. Yes. Thank you, I was about to do that again. So let me cut that onto its own layer. I'm too eager to draw my cool ending that I forgot to put it in the right place. And we have play, quit. Got it, I'll draw a tombstone. That's, 
that's assuming they ever find the body. So the main idea is just something about uh, there's a game over screen and then a play and quit. Okay, then I'll go to the good ending, have some sort of message about good job, you win, you kept most of your fingers, and then also a play and a quit. a little bit of code and then um, we'll take a break and then after that we'll have lab time so if you want to refine this a little bit or work on your tap frenzy which is due by midnight so let's do a little bit a little bit of coding and then we'll do the break in a moment so if you haven't polished up all of these screens yet again you'll have time to do that right now I just have and these quick environments 
and you know I want to go in and make that look perfect over here and you will be able to but for the moment let's do this we'll go back to our welcome scene and we will uh, add some action script here so um, Our actions layer. So we have the stop command. Now let's be careful here. We're going to be dealing with a lot of different scenes. Make sure you pay attention to when it tells you here what scene you're in and what frame you're in. In this in this game also, we're going to be dealing with action script uh, inside of symbols. We didn't quite get to it for the game, or the Tap Frenzy game, but for example, I wanted to tap a little bad guy and it makes a face or it winces or whatever. We couldn't quite get to that, but we'll do a version of that for, for the game here. For example, when I get to the painting, the very first painting, I want to tap it. I want it to move, I want it to wiggle or stretch or whatever. That's going to be animation that happens in a symbol. And so we're going to need to play and pause the symbol animation or loop the symbol animation. But this is just to remind you to pay attention to what particular scene or object you're, you're doing code in. Okay, before our stop command, we're going to add a variety of import commands. These import commands are important to be able to activate various features that we will need. We'll need flash.events.event, capital E, so that we can pay attention to various events that happen on the event that I click, on the event that I pick something up. So this activates the features to be able to pay attention to various events. I also forgot to mention, if you want to zoom in or out of your code, sometimes it's useful to zoom in and out. You can hold the control key on the mouse, on the keyboard, and then scroll wheel, and that lets you zoom in and out of your code. So I'm going to zoom in so you can see it. And it might be useful to zoom in yourself also, just in case. Because sometimes when I write something, was that parentheses or was that curly brace? So when I zoom in, you should see it. Next, another import, flash.media.sounds sound plural uh, singular we're gonna play sound in this project eventually background music that happens different music that happens in different scenes and also sound that happens when you interact with things when I open up the very first front gate I want it to then creak I want it to have a nice scary creaking sound as it opens so I'm activating sound features import Flash .net .url request. This is another feature, or this is another bit of code to activate a feature. Um, I have to double check exactly what that one does. Off the top of my head, I don't quite remember, but it has to do with, um, I think it has to do with opening external content. If I want to get something from a web address to display in my project, I can pull it from the internet and display it on my project. And then import flash events dot touch event. I want the ability to actually interact with my game by tapping it, touching it. Because addition, originally Adobe Animate, which was originally um, Adobe uh, Flash, which was originally Macromedia Future Splash, um, was set up for websites where you would click on things. But now we can make cool projects in Animate for devices. And devices have the ability to tap and touch them. So we're activating touch capabilities. And we can make a note here import various. Libraries for more features. And then a quick note stop the autoplay of the project. Oh, and then 
have one more thing here. Activate. Oh, touch features. We have multi-touch, capital M, dot input mode, capital M on that. Multi-touch, input mode, capital M, capital I, capital M, dot, all in caps, touch point. So this is just another basic thing. That's how we add it at the beginning of our project. In most programming languages, code is processed from top to bottom, left to right. So as soon as it gets to a particular command, it stops right there, it processes it, and then it moves on, semicolon. So we're setting up at the beginning of our project, as soon as our project loads up into the device, activate all of these advanced features. Capturing events, sounds, URLs, touch. Then it proceeds. OK, then activate the advanced touch capabilities, like tapping with two fingers, swiping, zooming, three fingers, all of that. We're activating all of the touch features. And then we're saying, don't play the next scenes. Next event handler. For going to help screen. Okay, this should be familiar. When I did the Tap Frenzy game, when we did the Tap Frenzy game, we had a button to go to help. And what we need to do was like four things. Draw the thing, turn it into a symbol, give it an instance name, and then write the code about it. Right now I'm about to jump to the fourth one, write the code about it. Well, I've already done the first one, draw the thing. I haven't done the symbolize the thing. I haven't done the give it an instance name, or that. It doesn't really matter the order that you do it. I could write the code first, and then draw the thing. The only problem will be is if I write the code first and try to test it, it will make an error, because our instance name doesn't exist yet. That's OK. We can handle it. So we'll write the code first, then we'll go back and make the button correct. So the code will be, we will eventually have a button very soon called welcome um, help underscore btn. In the welcome screen, I'll have a help button. I've drawn it, but I haven't symbolized it or given it an instance name. But welcome help btn dot add event listener. In the parentheses, we have to then say, what event are we listening for, comma, what function do we then run after that event happens? We are waiting for a touch, capital T, touch event, dot, touch tap, all in caps. Right here, I'm using the helpful pop-up right here to go find touch um, tap. Can press Enter so it types it for me comma. Again, spelling matters. Uh, it, why? Because when it was programmed, when this was invented, everyone that was on the team inventing this decided this is what we want. And it has to be capitals. So if it's not capitals, it doesn't work. So make sure your colors are like mine. This stuff is blue here, and that's gray, and that's uh, plain black, purple, etc. So the name of our button, event listener, in the event that we touch it, or tap it, comma, we will run a function, which we'll call fn go help. Next screen, function definition for fn go help. We're going to explain 
as before. Well, what does that even mean? That's not a real command. It didn't turn like one of the colors. We invented it. So we need to define on the next line. Function. The name of the function, fn go help. Parentheses, colon void, curly braces. So this particular game will have like 95% stuff we've seen before with a few new things. And the cool thing about most programming languages is, you know, there's 200 codes or so, but you don't have to memorize them all. You just need to look up the ones that are relevant to you. And you will see that over and over, I might use the same five ones or 20 ones or whatever. I don't need to know all 200. I just need to go look it up if I do need something different. What if I figure out a way that I want to be able to pick up a key and put it into a place? OK, I need to look up hit detection in action script. And now I know it, and I use it. But in the parentheses here, we need to then say event colon touch event. This one's easy to forget. And I usually do add it afterwards because I prefer to write the complete code than the details. Because if I start writing it, I might forget something. But this function is related to being used on events, particularly in touch events. So this matches here, touch event, touch event. This function will run when this event happens. See how they kind of match up. Wait for the button press, run this function. Here's the function. This function happens when there's an event of touch. Void. Curly braces, break those curly braces apart. Make a quick note and the function go help. Because like I said, when we have 400 lines of code, when you have one of your little curly braces straggling around, um, you're going to forget what it does maybe. Movie clip. Then we'll see, we'll use this code here that we saw before about go to and play. When we press a button, in this case, it's just going to go. But the point of using functions is you can group together a variety of commands. I want it to go somewhere, but also play a sound, but also give me a point, plus also whatever. And this particular one is just pretty straightforward. It's just going to go to another place. This dot root from the main timeline. So this is the same basically. From the main timeline, go to frame one of my help screen. Help me, what do I put in there based on that? Frame one of the help screen. What do I fill in the parentheses? Go to frame one. It's correct so far about that, but um, scene one, we don't have anything named in our scenes called scene one. Scene help, yep, first of all, one, because we're going to scene frame one of that scene and see how it pops up. It says, please input the frame number, comma, please input the name of the scene. So yep, next thing is SC help, or whatever you call yours. And confirming mine, yep, SC help. Okay, so right after this, we'll, we'll take our break. Uh, I want to do the same thing then for the play button. But now I want it to go to the first relevant scene, which is scene gate. So this way, because I know what I'm doing, I'm not going to add the comments. But uh, we'll have in the welcome screen, we have a play button which needs an event listener. Which happens in the, in the touch event, specifically touch tap, runs a function. We can make this up. What should we call the function we're inventing here? Fn go play, sure, that'll work fine. Fn go gate could also work. We're about to play the game, which makes perfect sense. 
I'm going to call it FN Go Gate. Because now that I've got these various screens and scenes and things, I might want to name them more specifically. Yes, I'm going to play, but specifically it's going to go to the gate. FN Go Gate. Go Play. Same thing. As long, you could call it FN Kitty Cat. And it'll work fine, as long as you fully program it that it does what you need it to. But let's kind of gauge people's um, thought process. Um, it could be FN Go Play or Go Gate. Raise your hand. How many of you vote for FN Go Play? What? That one? Okay, one, two, three, four. Four. How many of you FN go gate? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, so either way will work. I'm going to leave it as gate, but play would work just fine as long as it's consistent. So then, of course, next line I have to say the definition of FN go gate is thus. And it's going to be exactly the same as, as above. So this is a, the practice again about writing the syntax and it's all the same that inside of that uh, parentheses we have event touch event colon void it's the same thing on top over here I can copy and paste that and just change one thing scene gate because I still need to go to the first frame of a scene the scene is the gate. I need to go to that scene from the from the main timeline. So both of these are like 99% the same. What's different is what's the thing I'm clicking on. Here's the help button. Here's the play button. Where's the place I'm going to? Gate versus help. What's the name of the function? Go gate versus go help. Besides that, it's all exactly the same. Here's the part where I will I will end and then we'll do lab. But what I want you to do before you take your break, go to those two buttons on your welcome screen. Those two drawings, which are not buttons yet, turn those two buttons into symbols and give them the correct instance name so that this actually works. Uh, you want to confirm that when you actually run it and you click play, or help, it goes there. This code here, if you try to run it, you'll get an error because it'll say access of undefined uh, function welcome help. There is no welcome help yet. There's the graphic of it, but it has not been turned into a symbol and it has not been given the instance. So that's your task before you take your break. You're, you're one step outside of the box, which we've done before, so it shouldn't be completely alien. Just turn those two symbols turn those two graphics into symbols, give them instance names according to what we wrote here, and then it should work. So save it and run it. Uh, take a break if you'd like. When we come back, it's lab time. You can work on your tap frenzy. You can work on this to make sure this basic part works. You can work on the graphics of this if you want. Tap frenzy is due at uh, 11.55 p.m. tonight for full credit. And then when we come back Wednesday, we'll do more of the code and more lab time. Be there one moment.